Welcome everyone. We're delighted to have you for our first speaker of Illuminating History. My name is Anna Flores and I am the third partner collaborating on this project with the Cross Mills Library and, and the Charleston Historical Society. Um, I came to this as an ecological artist. I am uh, from Charlestown and um, almost 13 years ago I was artist in resident at U.S. Fish and Wildlife just down the road. Part of my work there was doing a project that really addressed what went on on the land and the various eras of human habitation. And as I did my research, obviously we had the very rich history of the Native Americans who are still here. Um, we had a, a great um, amount of evidence about the colonial people. And then I bumped into some information that said, um, and this land that the headquarters is on was Champlin Plantation with almost 200 slaves. And I thought, wow. Um, I'm also from Cuba, so my own background has, I don't have slaves in my background per se, but um, Cuba's history of course is very uh, involved with slavery. And at the time I was also doing a large project on my own personal public history of Cuba and, and it was a project that was going around the country called Cuba Journal. And I thought, you know, when I moved to Rhode Island and I moved to Charleston, I said to myself, I, I probably couldn't be further from Cuba here. <laughs> well, was I wrong? And um, over the past 13 years, I've come back to this history, history periodically through various projects. I've worked with Brown University doing a, an installation and research on um, slavery in Rhode Island. I did a project at the Newport Art Museum. <laughs> And I've been on committees who are addressing the history of slavery in this state because I think it's a very important history to bring out, to get into the public school curriculum, which it's not, which I think is um, a real problem. Um, but in all these endeavors, I always felt I was away from my center, which is South County, which has such an intensive history, which has been very unaddressed. So um, when the opportunity came up to do this collaboration with both Sarah and Pam from the Historical Society, I thought, how wonderful. First of all, it's a public library, a very dynamic public library where people come in for all kinds of wonderful programs. It's not an intellectual silo. You know, universities are wonderful, but sometimes they only attract a you know, particular kind of audience who's comfortable going there. Or, um, so it's very important, this kind of story, is very public, and, and I think this project is giving us a wonderful opportunity to do that. Um, we're delighted that all the scholars we have invited have just enthusiastically said yes for very little money, and um, Dr. Charlotte um, Farmington, Carrington Farmer is, is our first wonderful speaker, um, and we're delighted she's here. Um, we've also gotten a grant to do a catalog so that this history doesn't go underground again. Um, and the Rhode Island Foundation is funding that. And as part of that ca catalog, which will record the essays, I mean the um, talks and, and summarized essays, we also want a section on public response. And, and that's why I'm here talking to you today. We want your public feedback and your public response to this information, which is just, you know, touching, just beginning to dig into this history. What will bubble up, we can't predict. I know probably in the future there'll be probably some placemaking going on in the town. Um, I've worked with a medallion project in Rhode Island, which is going around the state marking slavery sites, so of course South County should have a lot of those medallions, but maybe there will be other opportunities for place marking. Um, but it's up to you to decide what, how this goes further. Um, and what we'd like to say is there are a couple of ways for you to respond. Of course, there's going to be question and answers after each speaker, and we want that to be as robust as possible, so don't be shy and speak up. 
but also there's opportunities where you can write in a journal that's outside by the books on slavery that are by the exhibit. You can also send us an email at illuminatinghistory at gmail.com or else you can write letters, the good old fashioned way, to Illuminating History at Cross Mills Library um, and use their address. Um, so don't hesitate to let this, you know, reflect on this and give us your stories, your feedback, um, because we're very eager for them. Okay? Thank you and enjoy. And Sarah will introduce uh, our speaker. everybody. Once again, a great turnout. I, there are at least three chairs open that I can see from here. So there's one right up front here. There's one right over here. And then that, that, that bag can get moved up. Yeah. And, oh, there's one right over here. So I think actually all of you are in the back there. I'm, because that's an emergency exit, would you mind coming? I know that means you have to come to the front of the <laughs> class here, but, um, and I would like to, so there's an exit right there, and then there's an exit right, right there as well. And then I'd also like to point out that we do have Bob Patron who volunteered to come here today to film this event. And I think that's very important because I want everyone to know that if, if for any reason you don't feel comfortable being in this enclosed space with lots of people, this is going to be online so it will be accessible online so just be aware of that you know we, we totally understand and you will be able to see a recording of the event tonight and the next two events going forward as well all right so i have the pleasure of introducing dr charlotte carrington farmer who is an associate professor at Roger Williams University. She specializes in early American history, and she teaches courses like Crime and Descent in Early New England, Native History of Early America, and Slavery in the Americas. She has written a biography of Thomas Morton, who was an early British colonizer of Massachusetts, and has more recently combined her interests in courses and early American history to write and lecture on the Narragansett Pacer, which is what we're going to be hearing about tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me, by the way? Yeah, just let me know if, uh, as we go along if you can't hear me. Thank you so much for that brilliant introduction and also for everyone coming out this evening, especially amidst um, coronavirus worries, so thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit then about the uh, Baker Mural and think about what that means as a historian. So tonight I want to try and frame this mural um, to think about the types of primary sources that we, as, as scholars, can use to learn about the lived reality of enslaved life that we can see right in front of us in the mural. So I want to start with um, maps as a primary source. So we can see here um, the Blasquitz map from uh, 1777, and the area that we're going to focus on tonight is, is over here, right, like on the West Bay. Uh, I, I live in the East Bay now in Barrington, so I'm, I've come across the bay, which I understand is a big thing to do in, in Rhode Island, crossing bridges. Uh, so please, you know, be thankful that I've made it across. And so we're going to focus on, on this side of the map. Um, but what's interesting to me about this map is, is some of the writing on here that can tell us a little bit about life in Rhode Island in the 18th century. Oh. Oh, there we are. It's working. Uh, so this is at the top of the map, and it says, you know, it's um, a topographical chart of the Bay of Narragansett and the province of New England. Um, but it also says it's taken by the order of the principal farmers um, on Rhode Island. Oh. 
There we go. I think I have to click it extra hard. Uh, so as I say then, this is the little bit of land that we're going to be focusing on. And we're going to be looking here. We're going to be talking. You see it says Up Dykes Harbour, if you turn your head, right? So we're going to be talking about the Up Dykes a little bit later. And then working our way kind of down South County here, you can see North Ferry marked on the map uh, and then South Ferry here. So geographically, this is where we're going to look. But as I said to you then, um, I'm interested in what the map can tell us um, in terms of writing. So you see on the right hand side here, it has a list of the principal farms in Rhode Island. And these are some of the people we'll be talking about this evening. Um, it also describes then uh, what life was like in Rhode Island at this point in the uh, 18th, uh, 18th century. It describes the climate. It talks about the summer and the winters. Um, you know, it says it enjoys many advantages. Um, it says the then it has several large rivers, uh, one of the finest harbors in the world. Um, you know, this is what got my eye on the map. It says on the map that the horses are bonny and strong. So for someone interested in equine history, I was thrilled to find that that was written on the map. You know, it says the meat, cattle, and sheep, uh, you know, so some of the largest in America, the butter and cheese, excellent, right? So all of the things that we see in the Bacon mural, we can see that is, is written onto the map. So in addition to maps then, we can also look at published accounts that describe life in Rhode Island in the late 17th and into the 18th century. So as early as 1690, an anonymous visitor described how Rhode Island is of considerable bigness and justly called the Garden of New England. For its excellence for sheep, Oh, sorry, I've just missed a line out. For its fertility and pleasantness, it abounds in all things necessary for the life of man. It's excellent for sheep, kine, and horses, and being environed by the sea, it's free from the dangers of bears, wolves, and foxes. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. Um, the people live in great plenty, and this is what we're interested in tonight, and send horses and provisions to Barbados and the Leeward Islands. So let's fast forward a little bit later then. So writing in 1775, we see that William Douglas agreed with what our anonymous author had said in the late 17th century. He said the most considerable farms are in Narragansett country and that the largest of these milks 110 cows, cuts about 200 loads of hay and makes about 13,000 weight of cheese besides butter and sells off considerable calves, fattened bullocks and horses. We see then, and this is the last quote I'll give you, um, that as far as 1795, um, William Winterbotham, his account from 1795 further adds to this view. And it, he describes the tra tract of country lying between South Kingston and the Connecticut line, the, co the called Narragansett country, it's excellent grazing. And it's, it's, it's inhabited by a number of wealthy farmers who raise some of the finest neat cattle in New England. Narragansett has been famed for an excellent breed of pacing horses. The present exports are flaxseed, lumber, horses, cattle, beef, pork, fish, poultry, onions, butter, cheese, barley, grain, spirits, and cotton and linen goods. So I think there are two things then that we've described so far, both from looking at the map and also the published account, that are really central to the economy's development here in South County, and they're export and slave labor. And you can see here then that Baker captured both of these. You can see on the mural that he's got the horses um, and the livestock, the sheep here, the cattle here. Uh, you know, he's got the cheese going on here. So all of the things we've seen from the primary sources so far um, in terms of export commodities, Baker captures as he does centering um, enslaved workers on the mural. Right? So we can see then that this again is backed up by a range of other different primary sources. So one of the sources that I'm really interested in is Board of Trade reports. And if, if anyone's ever read them, they're, they're truly, really fascinating. And I think they're in a kind of really underutilized type of primary source. So the 1740 report that you see up on the screen, it says the West Indies have likewise reaped great advantage from our trade, i.e. Rhode Island's trade, being supplied with lumber of all sorts suitable for building houses, sugar works, and making casts, beef, port, flour, and other provisions, we are daily carrying to them with horses to turn their mills and vessels for their own use. And our African trade often furnishes them with slaves for their plantations. 
So my talk tonight is not really going to be about horses per se. They're the thing I'm interested in, but I'm going to focus on slavery more generally. But I want to just take this as an opportunity to, again, share some of the primary sources that us historians use to tell this story. So you can see here, then, this is an advert from the Providence Gazette from uh, 1763. Uh, Nicholas Brown and company, you know, they're, they're the, 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 the big, big players out of Providence. Uh, but we can see, then, that what we the horses we see in the mural right are going to be exported right so in the mural you'll see here, there are two actually two kinds of horses. So these chestnut ones here are riding horses. They're Narragansett Pacers. But this horse here, can you notice its its feathers are really heavy? It's a lot thicker set. That is. Could you tell us, please, where that mural is? Who painted it? Yeah. And, and when and. Give us a little background on that, please. I, so I'm going to go, if, if it's okay with you, I've written this backwards, that I'm going to tell you the history, and then I'm going to circle back to the, the history of the mural at the end to tie it in. So that's the way I'm going to go. Oh. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so what you see here, then, as we're saying, are, are the two types of horses. And we see this backed up. Um, ooh, uh, woo, I'm sorry, it's jumping a little bit. Uh, maybe I'll just press it on here. Um, we see... Uh, we see here then this is uh, backed up. So you can see here then the Browns are sending their horses specifically to the Dutch colony of Suriname. So this is really important when we're thinking about slavery in Rhode Island, right? Not only are the slaves um, laboring here, but they're also um, making it possible for other slave societies to exist. So the horses that they breed and raise here um, are then exported and often traded for a human life, right? The Brown family, there's um, a letter in the John Carter to Brown Library where they're like, we'll, we'll send one Negro girl, is the quote, for a bunch of horses, right? So it's not just about understanding slavery here in, in South County, it's about thinking about how that connects to the wider Atlantic world um, in terms of exchanges for horses and human life to export. And then when the commodities that the slaves in South County raised, they then went on to work in places like Suriname, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Jamaica, uh, Barbados, all of the sugar colonies in the West Indies and South America to again work alongside slave labor, right, crushing the mill. So it's not a local history, really, when we think about slavery in South County. We have to think about that broader Atlantic term. <coughs> So I'm not going to talk about um, horses per se, but I'm more than happy, as Sarah said, to talk about that, that particular element of my, um, my research in the Q&A. So one of the things that strikes me, I mean, I originally work on the 17th century, so I'm now moving into the 18th century. But in the 17th century, it's really clear that enslaved people lived and labored in Rhode Island, really from the get-go of the colony, right through into the 19th century. So I work at Roger Williams University, so there's a lot of emphasis on our students learning about our namesake. And so one of the things I spend a lot of time doing is studying documents by and about Roger Williams. And what you can see on here is um, his book, A Key into the Language of America, which came out in 1643. And in the chapter in of their persons, of their, you know, their, and their body parts, you can see that he's got the Narragansett word for hand and hands and nails and belly and a foot and toes and whatever. But he also has the word, and bear in mind, this is the 1640s, he also records the Narragansett word for someone who's white, someone who is black, and someone who is a coal black man. Right? So this is Rhode Island, this is Narragansett country in the 1640s. So what does that mean? What does that mean for scholars thinking about slavery here as early as the 1640s, right? The fact that the Narragansetts have a word that Roger records in a key for a coal black man, right? And he breaks it, the terminology down, right? So think about the fact that to form this word, the Narragansett have got the word Suki is black, right? And then Watakone, someone who wears clothes. So this is clearly a word that they've kind of like meshed up together that Roger encountered. So I show you this then to show that really from the get-go, slavery is central to, to Rhode Island. So we know then that slaves in Rhode Island labor in what Christy Clark Quajara terms, quote, the business of slavery. And as you can see on the map, merchants transported local agricultural products, especially horses, livestock, sheep, and cows, fish, candles, lumber, cheese, etc., to the sugar plantations in the West Indies and South America in exchange for molasses. And then the same merchants then bought that molasses back to Rhode Island and sold it to local distilleries who used it to make rum, you know, one of the key exports from the colony. 
So the statistics then on slaves in Rhode Island and also particularly in South County are a little bit in flux and I'm going to share a few of the kind of variations with you. So um, Christy Clark Punjara estimates that Rhode Islanders trafficked more than 60% of all um, North American trade in African slaves. By 1750, Rhode Islanders held the highest proportion of slaves in New England. 10% of the total population was enslaved, double the northern average. And in 1720, there was an estimate of 543 slaves in Rhode Island. And by 1750, that had gone up to 3,347. So we're able to use kind of a, a range of different primary sources to, to kind of flush out these figures. And I just want to share a couple of the, these with you. I'm a social cultural historian, not like an economic historian. So I feel like people's stories tend to tell a better uh, way of trying to connect with stuff than, than statistics. But I do want to share the census data with you. Um, so you can see here then I've done the, the census for 1730. Um, and we can see from that that enslaved people were heavily concentrated in the port cities of Newport, Providence and Narragansett country. And you'll hear me use this term and I really, you know, in the q and I'm more than happy to talk about how we see in the 18th century this term South County, Kings County, Narragansett country used interchangeably by the people who are writing the history correctly or incorrectly. So I'm going to follow their lead with that. So historian era Berlin famously differentiated a slave society from a society with slaves. And Berlin says then, in a slave society, slave labor is essential to the economy, and slaveholders constituted the ruling class. The difference then is in a society with slaves, slave labor was marginal to the overall economy and slaveholders were part of but did not dominate the elite class. And I want to try to make the case to you this evening that South County was a slave society. Right? It wasn't just a society with slaves, it was a slave society within the wider Rhode Island slash New England society with slaves. So I think it's really clear, hopefully, from the sources that we'll look at together tonight that slave labor was central to the economy here and to social hierarchy. And in fact, slaveholders did dominate the ruling class. So there's been some debate amongst historians about where South County plantations got their slaves. And one way of thinking about this is to try and unpick this chronologically and to assess how things changed during the course of the 18th century. So we see then um, that the governor in 1708 made this comment, and I'm going to read it, uh, the full one with you. He says, we have inspecting into the books of Her Majesty's customs that from the 24th of June 1698 to the 25th of December 1707, we've not had any Negroes imported into this colony from the coast of Africa. The whole and only supply of Negroes in this colony is from the island of Barbados, from whence is important one year with another betwixt 20 and 30 and if those arrive well and sound the general price is from 30 to 40 pounds per head we have advised with the chiefest of our planters like here in Narragansett country and find there would be not disposed in this colony above 20 or 30 at the most annually the reasons of which are chiefly attributed to the general dislike of our planters have for them by reason of their turbulent and unruly tempers and that most of our planters that are able and willing to purchase any of them are supplied by their offspring of those they already have. So think about this. This is 1708, right? They're already talking that this is long generational slavery, which increased daily. And that inclination of our people in general is to employ white servants before Negroes. Okay. Um, so we think then... Um, Again, looking at the, across the historical accounts, some of them suggest then that Narragansett planters such as Roland Robinson Jr., Thomas Hazard, imported their own slaves directly onto the landings at Boston next. Um, I think we see some of that, but really from the stuff that I've looked at, it seems to me that Newport is the key slave market for importations for, for planters here, and then to a lesser extent, Providence. So again, I want to share some of these primary sources with you. So um, what you 
you see on the screen then is an account book that's held at Newport Historical Society. So uh, when, when merchant Thomas Richardson wrote to his friend John Mumford in 1739, he described a recently arrived cargo of slaves. He said, you know, here are sundry new Negroes in town to be both sold, girls and boys from 10 to 12 and 16 to 18, eight years of age, whose prices, right, go from 80 to 110 pounds. We can also, as historians, use newspaper adverts as another primary source in addition to letters. So um, you can see here an example that I pulled from the Newport Mercury in 1763. Um, you can see that it says, you know, um, on Thursday last arrived from the coast of Africa, the brig Royal Charlotte, uh, with a parcel of extreme fine, healthy and well-limbed Gold Coast slaves. And one of the things I'm really interested in in my wider research is looking at the language that was used to describe um, human property and non-human animal property, right? Those words are the exact same words they use when they're describing horses that they've been for sale. But that's an aside, right? So we've got men, women, boys, and girls. And again, let's think about the two kind of key markets for slaves in Rhode Island, right? The, there were the town slaves, right, that would primarily be in Newport and perhaps in Providence. But this, right, so gentlemen in town and country, i.e. here um, in South County, have an opportunity to furnish themselves with such as will suit them, right? And he says, you know, you best get moving. If not, they're, they're going to be um, they're going to be gone very quickly. Uh, those that remain on hand will be shipped off very soon. So newspaper reports of slaves arriving into Rhode Island are a really useful primary source for, for us historians to use. So I want to think about, like, again, what was it like to live as a slave in Rhode Island in the 18th century? So we know that most slaves lived perhaps in the house of their, their masters. Uh, some perhaps lived in the attic or in the barn. Um, you know, if only a few planters perhaps had separate quarters for their slaves. It varied from farm to farm. Um, and again, we can talk about some of the case studies a little bit later, which meant then that the slaves here were under constant scrutiny. And I know this is an image that you've been using uh, in other other talk, so I just wanted to show this. So um, there's a lot of debate about how many slaves individual farms and families had here in South County, right? So again, as historians, let's think about the primary sources that we can use. So there were a couple of really useful primary sources, estate inventories, right? When people died, we can see like how many how many um, slaves they owned, how many animals they owned, etc. Uh, and then probate, probate records um, are also really great sources. So using some of these sources then, um, we can see that some planters had perhaps 40, 50, maybe even 60 slaves. Some of them had fewer slaves, perhaps 20 as an average or so. Um, you know, some of them only had four, five or six slaves. Um, uh, so I'll give you a couple of specific examples. We know that the Stanton family at one point had 40 slaves. Robinson, Roland Robinson had around 28 or so. Uh, and then his father had 19. So part of the confusion, I think, is record keeping and also confusion over the terminology. Um, we know that the planters employed um, indigenous peoples and also indentured servants. So looking at the mural then we can see really clearly that Baker did not include any indigenous peoples or any white servants in this mural. And I think this is worthy of pause, right? So for me looking at the early sketches so when I moved to Rhode Island seven years ago, um, I started this project. I, I flew my own horse over from England and it prompted me to think about like how crazy that was, right? Like how did they do that in the 17th and 18th century? Um, and so I, I then started this project on, on horses in the early modern Atlantic world, which is where my interest in the mural comes. So I went straight to what was then called Petersquamset Historical Society, now South County History Center. And I went to look at the mural and when I got there, they told me this fascinating story um, about how the how Baker's daughter had come to the society and said, oh, you know, my, my dad painted this mural. I've got some sketches if you want them. And they were like, okay, sure. I, I feel like the version I heard seven years ago was like, 
they were a bit disbelieving, right? They were like, yeah, sure, he painted it, send us the sketches. And then lo and behold, in the mail, like this bundle of like early sketches came through. So I spent some time seven years ago, and then yesterday, just to refresh my memory, uh, looking through these sketches. So in some of the early sketches, I want you to have a look then at what doesn't make it to the final mural. At the bottom, we've got um, the white planters kind of engaged in leisure pursuits, but that's not what I'm really that interested in. I'm interested in what's going on in this kind of front left hand side and you can see here then that there's an indigenous man who seems to be holding an ear of corn right uh, in some of the very early sketches you can see he's here he's, he seems to just be holding his hand up uh, and then this is the version that, that didn't make it right so my talk is not about indigenous peoples tonight but I just want to kind of throw this out there right that, that Baker went through this process and there's um, a booklet that came out when they moved the mural to um, the historical society that very briefly touches on his reasons behind this. That, uh, and again, we can talk a little bit more in the Q&A about this, but I just wanted to flag this. Um, so I think we need to think about though, how this connects to what was going on in Rhode Island in the 18th century, right? So I want to just flag a, um, a really interesting secondary source that was published just a few years ago. So the article that you see on the screen here, and I put the full citation for people in case you do want to look it up. It looks about then, it looks at um, how um, historians and indigenous people can combine oral history and then primary source analysis to try to kind of center indigenous voices in the narrative. And the article that you see on the screen then talks about how the Narragansett were written out of the historical records. Essentially town leaders, when they were dealing with what they might term Indians, stop referring to them as Indians, right? N no reference to a tribe, right? Just even Indians. And they were written out of the record and simply designated as Negro and I'm quoting here, or black. And so the article talks about documentary genocide, right? And there's some really interesting cases in there of um, um, like um, uh, indigenous peoples basically suing people for categorizing them wrong right here in South County. So this is not research that I've done, but I just wanted to share that with you um, this evening. So let's focus on what the mural does focus on, I guess. Um, so we know then that the mural focuses on enslaved peoples and their working life, right? So outside of the mural, we can see and we know that slaves form their own family. We don't see that, right? The mural is, is the economic activities, right? It's not the slave life or whatever. But we do know that the slaves we see in the mural formed their own families, which were not legally, legally recognized, but there were clear multi-generational slave families who often live together here in South County. We know that in North Kingston, a slave named Moll had several children and eventually went to have um, a couple of grandchildren too, who all seemed to live in the same area together. This allowed then enslaved people to pass on community traditions, share family stories, um, but it's not all happy history, right? So I want to share a kind of a counter example to that. So the Reverend Dr. James McSparron is, um, is a really interesting 18th century source that shares a lot of um, his life, both as um, a preacher and as a planter. So we know then that McSparron's farm had, he had a slave called uh, Maroka, who was in a consensual uh, relationship with a slave known as Mingo, who lived on a neighboring farm, right? And these two had a couple of children. So they did this in defiance of McSparron, um, and he ordered them to end their relationship, but they continued to see each other. And in punishment, he sold off their youngest kid. So again, like we don't see that in the mural, but these are stories that we have to think about, right? I think one of the things that people in New England, uh, people in the North in general like to think that either one, slavery was nothing to do with us, and if it was, it was just a trade, right? We weren't directly living in it. And three, if we do have slaves here, right, it, it's not that bad, right? And I really want to push back on those stereotypes and say, it's really horrific what happens here in, in South County. Um, so anyway, so they sell off the kids. So let's think about this moment, right, of just selling or giving people away as property. So again, let's back up and think about the uh, primary sources. So up on the screen then, the document again that comes from 
um, uh, from the Historical Society, it says here from 1797, it reveals a process of like gift your, giving someone away, right? So it says, you know, I, Ezekiel, Ezekiel Gardner, of, um, a senior of North Kingston County of Washington, do hereby grant and convey unto George Irish of Middletown in the county of Newport for the consideration of love and goodwill and natural affection as a kinsman and relation, one Negro man, um, for life named Mingo, aged 24 years and about eight months. To him, the said Joy I George Irish is heirs to his and only their benefit, behoof and forever for him or their use. Right? So it's not just um, monetary transactions that we see. Right? We see slaves just gifted away within families. So other types of primary sources that we as historians can use are um, newspaper adverts, right? I showed you a couple of examples from earlier, but I want to just show you a few examples of, um, I guess, uh, skilled, uh, skilled um, slaves who were advertised. So you can see here, then this is from the Newport Mercury in 1760. It says a Negro man to be sold by Matthew Robinson. So again, right here in South, uh, South Kingston. Um, but some of them tell you some of the jobs, right? So think back to what you saw in the Baker mural, right? So that one of the key jobs that enslaved laborers had here in South County was animal husbandry. So again, how do we know that? How might Baker know that? We can see from the adverts, right, that a valuable Negro man who understands all sorts of husbandry business, right? So he's gonna apply here for uh, Thomas Brown at Tower Hill. We can also see then other adverts, right? So a likely lusty Negro boy, about 17 years of age, he will suit a farmer extremely well, right? So these are the types of slaves that we can bring to life within the mural. <coughs> I'm just going to show you a couple more examples just so you've got a breadth so you don't think I'm just showing you one example and that's the only one, right? There are countless ones. I want to kind of reinforce the volume of these adverts. So um, this one is advertising someone who they don't need anymore, right? So a person, any person that wants a Negro man and woman who understands farming business well by applying to the printers may be informed where they may be supplied with both, right? Um, they are to be sold for want of employ the present owner having, uh, not having it for them of his own so he, he doesn't need them at the moment so he's going to sell them so we see these uh, these adverts uh, time and time again and they give us uh, an insight into some of the skills that enslaved laborers had um, so there's uh, other ways that we as historians can think and bring this history that we see in the mural to life. And one of the most kind of tactile, interactive ways to learn about life here in South County is to kind of just drive around a bit, right? Like that's one of the, my favorite things to do when I'm trying to learn about this particular history, especially as a British person, right? And grow up here in Rhode Island, is to drive around and have a look at the landscape and try to figure out where some of these plantations um, were or still are. So I've done a lot of work uh, with Smith's Castle, right? And I think that's a really good example that I want to just share with you very briefly. Um, so Richard Smith Jr. was one of the first planters within the region. And when he died, he bequeathed Cucumset to his nephew, Lodwick Updike. And the Updike family developed Cucumset into a large plantation. And at its height, it had more than three, 3,000 acres. It was divided into a couple of different farms, the work by tenant farmers. We know they had in indentured servants, and we also know they had enslaved, uh, enslaved laborers working there. We can see that from a couple of different sources, right? If you go to Smith's Castle, you'll see on the wall they have the estate inventory, right, where they have their human property listed and they have their animal property listed. So we can see from estate inventories um, that the Updike family had slaves. But remember I just said um, it goes to Lodwick Updike. So we can trace this, this person in the, in the newspaper articles. And again, thinking about how we don't want to say that this is a lovely place, right? Like slavery is not that bad here in South County. One of the things that we can look at is runaway slave adverts. So from the area where Smith's Castle is now, we can see that slaves ran away from the Updike family. So run away here from the subscriber at North Kingston in the colony of Rhode Island, a young Negro man named Demas born in this country. So again, think about that generation slavery. Um, uh, and what that means, a well-set fellow about five feet four inches high, um, has a down look, is thin-jawed, and has a visible scar from the bridge of his nose over his cheek. How did he get that? 
right? I mean, I raised that as, as a point to think about. Um, reaching beyond the corner of his mouth, and then it described exactly what he had on so people could, uh, could look out for him. Um, and he affects the sailor, right? He's a subtle fellow um, and has got a forged pass, which is suspected um, he will affect his escape to Boston. Has he some acquaintances there, right? So whoever takes him up and brings him back will get this reward. So we see then that not only just driving around and looking at the estates, we can then connect that back to the primary sources that we see, such as newspaper adverts. Um, so um, let's think then about um, how the mural, we can bring it to life with uh, non-written sources.